Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to manage vets consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Bend. Uh, today, I'm really kind of pumped to have my good friend, Mary Mongioi, on uh, the, this episode. Mary is an attorney with uh, the law firm of Forcelli, Deegan, and Terena. Yep, sorry. Uh, since 2015, she has been a partner. She concentrates her practice on veterinary corporate transactional matters, and she chairs the firm's veterinary practice group. She also provides strategic counsel to large corporate and individual practices on all aspects of corporate law, including practice acquisitions and sales, which is keeping her very busy, uh, and other partnership matters. And she is my personal Mary, what do you think about this whenever I have some kind of legal question? Uh, she also has been included in Crane's New York Business 2022 Notable Women of Law honorees, and she was an adjunct professor of law at uh, Toro College, where she taught business law and real estate. So Mary, thanks for your time today. Thanks for making time out of your insane schedule to be on the bench. <laughs> The most fun I'll have today, Miss Well, so it's all good. Say, well, considering <laughs> you're talking about mergers, acquisitions, and contract law, I hope so. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Well, um, we've known each other. We are Vet Partners members together, and we also have a, a girls group called the Hens, and we meet one Friday a month, and then we're kind of a little mastermind group, and we, we help each other and support each other. Uh, but uh, Mary, you just you kind of came towards my neck of the woods by getting a house in South Carolina. So we are going to be even closer neighbors now than we are. But I do want to talk about your origin story and tell me, you know, was I, and most veterinarians want to be a veterinarian from the time they're like five. Did you want to be a lawyer from the time you were five? No, absolutely not. And as usual with my life, it's a funny story. Um, at least it amuses me now. I, for my entire life, from the time I was a child, like a young girl, wanted to be a teacher. And in spe specifically, I wanted to teach English because I loved reading and books and language. And that was my thing. I was blessed with very strong female role models, teachers, um, a couple in particular. And um, I just admired them and wanted to do that. And I pursued it and I went to college and I majored in English, I minored. Um, of course, I personally think you should try student teaching before your senior year, because if it turns out the way mine did, you might consider a career change sooner. But in any event, it happens your second semester of senior year. And I was teaching in New York City public schools um, without giving away my age. Uh, Ed Koch was the mayor of New York City, and he decided that the thing to do to save money was to cut all sports programs in, in city schools. I was teaching at Susan Wagner High School on Staten Island, and needless to say, the students did not take that well. And riots began, and fires began to be sat, set in desks, and cars were overturned, and kids were rioting in the hallways. And I'm very short, I was very young, and I was constantly mistaken for a student. So um, I very quickly, for that reason, and the fact that they were making me teach like my Antonia to the senior football team who had, you know, did not want to learn. Um, I used to go to school every day, teach what I could, go back to school, find a sorority sister, go to 
the Hawk's Nest on campus, drink um, my lunch and dinner and have some dinner and then go back to my room, cry and do it all again the next day. Like, I hated it. I hated everything about it. So I decided I was not meant to be a teacher. And I never studied for the LSATs. I never, you know, I was like, well, what else can I do? I like language. I like helping people. I'll be a lawyer. So I went, I paid my money at the door. I took the LSATs. I did exceedingly well. I, um, I applied late to five schools. I was accepted at four, and, but waitlisted because I had waited so long. And I think I was finally accepted three days before school started. Oh my gosh. I had no books. I had done no reading. I was behind the eight ball and playing catch up the whole semester. But at the end of the day, I think there's a plan right? And um, I really do uh, 35, almost 40 years later, love what I do. Um, and so maybe things happen for a reason. I, you know, I've always believed that to be true. When I was in college, I have a degree in animal science, but every elective I took was an English lit class. So I may have been the only animal science major that was taking Chaucerian English and loving it. And expository <laughs> speaking and those kind of classes. But yeah, I had enough with, I think with one or two more credit hours and I should have done it. I was stupid not to do it. I would have had a minor in English. Um, and fortunately it pays off now because I write so much that that content creation, all that English lit comes back. So obviously student teaching was your first curveball, right? Um, and that's really funny that you say that because my best friend growing up, her mother was a teacher. She was, you know, always going to be a teacher. The first uh, year out as a teacher, a student teacher, she had the same experience you did, just, you know, horrible school, uh, horrible experience. And that was it. She ditched her education and she actually went to work for LabCorp. And now she's a minister. So, you know, there's uh, life throws you curveballs for it, uh, a very good intention. Uh, we, we may not know the purpose of it, but the purpose is there. So um, how was law school for you? Was that challenging or you, you did great on it your- It was, business? it was, but you know what? Um, I come, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Um, you know, my, everybody was so invested in this endeavor, right? Um, then when I got accepted to law school, everybody was even more invested in that endeavor. I, big Italian family from Brooklyn, the first one to go on to a profession was a big deal. And um, when you start out behind the curveball, you, you, you have to play catch up. So law school was tough. The first year was hard. Um, a lot of people already knew each other. It was um, a lot of people from, in, it was a New York school. They had been to summer camp together. I was not a summer camp person. You know, they knew each other from um, undergrad. I was the only one from my school going on to, to law school there. So it was just, you know, a little bit of a curve and then just figuring out, you know, you're all of a sudden you're just thrown into this world of contracts and criminal law and real property law and trying to figure out what resonates with you and where you think you can bring value to a profession and to people. So that that took a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not a huge fan of law school. I I was engaged to be married. I was wanted out. I wanted out quickly. I wanted my life to go on. So I did it in two and a half years instead of three. Oh, wow. Um, and then I pushed and pushed and pushed to get out, got a job. And then the engagement second bend, right? The engagement doesn't uh, hold up. It doesn't work out. So, but I got a head start. I was out. I was done. I was finished. Um, so that it is what it is. You pick up your toys and move on. And, um, I, you know, you kind of just never look back and you just set your foot on a road. And, and uh, at the time, jobs were hard to come by. It was the mid 80s. Um, you know, it was not a great job market. And everybody said, well, what do you want to be? I was like, I really want to be a products liability lawyer. You know what you turn out to be? You turn out to be what your first job trains you to be because you really don't know anything when you get out. Yeah. <laughs> you don't, right? So I went to work for a firm and I did real estate a lot. I did a lot of real estate. I did a lot of commercial litigation and I did a lot of matrimonials. And then um, and then you just kind of progress down the road and you see mm -hmm. where it takes you. Yeah. And so I'm I said about the veterinary 
I mean, I know you're a huge animal lover, but okay. how did that, I mean, this is kind of a, an unusual uh, uh, market, I guess, to, to specialize in, especially when you guys started it, because now I can totally see that it's a, it's a shark tank out there feeding frenzy. But like when you first started this veterinary thing, um, how did that come about? So it's really kind of interesting. I had my own small firm um, and I was here. I came to visit a friend who worked at Forcelli just to visit. They had been in my old office in my suite and they merged their practice here at Forcelli. And I just came to visit. And the gentleman I had come to visit said, oh, I would like to you know, introduce you to some people. And I was like, I really just came to say hi, have lunch, right? And he brought me into Jeff Forcelli's office. He's the managing partner of this firm to this day. This was in 2004. Um, and Jeff, very personable, very, you know, forthcoming. He's like, so where did you go to school? And I went to Hofstra Law School. And he's, well, what about undergrad? And I said, oh, a small school on Staten Island. Nobody ever heard of it. Um, and he's like, really? And I said, yeah. And he's like, well, can you sing that alma mater from that school? I said, you want me to sing? my college alma mater. Yes, can you sing it? I said, well, I'm a sorority girl. Of course I can sing my alma mater. And he goes, go ahead. And I'm looking at my friend and he's, looking at <laughs> and he's like, all right. So I start to sing the Wagner College alma mater and Jeff Forcelli starts to sing it with me. And he said to my friend, he's like, you out, you sit. I've always wanted to hire a Wagner graduate. What do you do? And we sat and talked for an hour. And at the end of that hour, I went back, spoke to my partners. I gave them six weeks notice. And I started here in the Trust and Estates Litigation Department, um, which really runs side by side. t and &E and corporate run side by side. There's, there's so many crossovers between them. So that's what happened. And that's how I came here. And about, I don't know, eight years ago, nine years ago, one of the corporate partners here his son graduated that school and he came to me and he said, you know, he needs help negotiating his employment agreement. Can you help him? And I said, no. And I, he's just like, why? I was like, because I don't know the first thing about how veterinarians get paid. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't know if he was getting a good deal or a bad deal. I can tell you a con, you know, how to, I can tell you what his salary is going to be, but I, I, you know, I don't know anything. So he said, you'll figure it out. So what did I do? I found Dr. Jim Wilson, uh -huh. right? And um, I called him up and I said, I introduced myself. I told him what I was doing. And he's like, let me help you. So he helped me for no apparent reason other than he liked me. And he helped me understand the process. He gave me his book, right? And, um, and at the end, when we were done and his, you know, the contract was signed. He said, Mary, you know, I think you could do this. I think you should do this. And I said, do what? He's like, well, there's only one of me east of the Mississippi. Yeah. Like, I'll, like, you should join vet partners, like, meet people. You'll love this industry. I'll introduce you to people. So that's what we did. Wow. And um, I've been a vet partners member this year is set, I think, year seven. Year seven. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I will tell you that without him and that introduction and the generosity of other attorneys, uh, Trey Cutler, Ed Guigici, people who were there with a helping hand and welcoming arms and, and my hens, right? Yeah. Um, uh, they have, I am where I am today because of it, mm -hmm. without a question in my mind, the value yeah. of the organization, um, what you put into it, you will more than get out of it. Oh, I, I absolutely agree with you there. Um, it, yeah, I just, I love the association. And it's made me so many good friends and the contacts and the ability to reach out to these brilliant minds and say, I need some help here or my client needs some help here. You know, how about that? Well, I have to tell you a funny story about, about Dr. Jim Wilson. Um, I, I've known Jim for a, quite a while, and you're right, he was the guru. I mean, he wrote the book, he was the DVM with the, the JD, and when you take your uh, certified veterinary practice manager test, 
his book is on the required reading list. Well, you've read the book, right? <laughs> it's pretty dry. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating now at the yeah. time yes I would but, agree you know, if you're not a lawyer and you're you're just you're a practice manager it is really really dry so I you know I kind of cursory looked through the book and I never read it and somebody said how did you pass your CPPM and I went well you know what I've been practicing and managing hospitals for 23 or four years I mean if you and and I actually was the you know, I was not a manager who was micromanaged. I was allowed, I was turned loose manager. And I got into a lot of stuff because we had a lot of big practices. We had a lot of practices. And so just life taught me a lot of things. I'd been through an IRS audit, you know, I've been through lots of contract work with my associate veterinarians. I've been there and done that. And then Jim has a lot of great information on his website. So I will tell you, I kind of went the Cliff Notes website version. <laughs> yeah. I went right to the man himself. <laughs> yeah, he went to Jim. <laughs> but you were, I went right there. <laughs> you were, you were going to be like looking after somebody's life. Man, I was just trying to pass a test. That's, that's what I did with mine. So anyway, uh, I love that. I love the fact that Jim was the one who got you in there. So, um, you know, this is a big change. Like you've changed firms, you've changed career trajectory and got into something that you really didn't know anything about. That takes some bravery. So how do you kind of talk to yourself to overcome these fears and say, you know, I'm just going to go for it. If you're going from teacher to take an LSAT. And you I'll got tell it. you, sometimes yeah. it's not bravery or overcoming fear. Sometimes it's just I'll try it. And if it doesn't work out, I'll just pick myself up by my bootstraps, but I will have lost nothing other than maybe a little bit of pride. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know, I, I wouldn't say I'm a risk taker, but I do bet on myself. I bet on myself that I can learn pretty much anything um, down to, you know, I was doing, you know, purchases and sales, buy-ins, associate buy-ins, private sales, you know, right after I joined Vet Partners and growing and, and, you know, meeting people from banks and building out a referral network. And then I met three gentlemen who were founding a consolidate, consolidation company. And I met them at a Vet Partners meeting um, through someone at Vet Partners. And, you know, I had a nice conversation with them. They were represented. I wasn't looking for their work, but we just spent a lot of time talking and three, two and a half months later, they called and said, you know, we have this great big law firm and they don't know anything about the vet world, but you know, the vet world, can you, would you come on and, and represent us? And I was like, okay, right. Okay. So I interviewed and um, with them, I met, we spoke for at length and then they said, well, you know, you have, we're going to be backed by private equity. I said, all right. And um, they're like, well, you have to interview with the attorney for the private equity company. And if he gives you his blessing, then, you know, we're good to go. You'll be, be hired. I'm like, okay, when should I do that? Like today. <laughs> hey. and, and so they're like, no, I was like, oh, give me a steam. And I'm like, all right, I can talk to pretty much anybody. I Google him and he's like a partner at one of the biggest law firms in Manhattan. And, you know, he's represented this fund and billions of dollars. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, what am I going to do? I like, I go down the hall and speak to my partner and they're like, well, Google him, see if you, you know, know if he, where he started and maybe, you know, and sure enough, we knew some of the same people. Mm -hmm. He had started at a firm here on Long Island. And so there was at least that bit of commonality and, you know, we had a conversation and, and I'm not an M&A lawyer by trade. I am not, but that's essentially what this is. These roll-ups, these consolidations are M&A. And um, he actually, you know, we spoke for about an hour and he said, you know, what do you see as the biggest risk for our client? And then at that point, I'm like, well, I must have this job because he's saying our client, but what do you think, you know, the biggest risk for? And I said, well, that you don't keep your veterinarians, that you buy these hospitals and you don't, like you're buying their EBITDA, but their EBITDA is really tied to people, people that are generating it. And you have to 
you know, have in place a plan for accommodating the veterinarians that are there and giving them a great work environment. Because if you can't keep them, you you paid a lot of money for goodwill that doesn't exist. And a bottom line, and you know, and then we talk. I said, you know, there's the drug crisis. There's you know, you know, the suicide epidemic, however you want to call it. And um, so I talked, and I was like, no, I'm sorry. I could talk about risk for the next three hours. Is there a specific risk you want me to address? He's like, no, we're all good here. So I was like, all right, you know, three hours on the phone. That Saturday, my client came to New York because they were based elsewhere. They came to New York and they dropped off 18 letters of intent, all of which had been signed for months and not been closed. And they all had to close by, you know, within three months. And I was like, I, I hadn't built a team. I, you know, I have 65 lawyers in my firm, but like I, I was like, oh, I can do better in every transaction. Well, no, thank goodness. I have, you know, two people from employment that jumped in. I have a, a corporate partner that came out of m and and he's now my right hand per- person, right? We work together every single day and we've hired other people to service this and taken on this client and others. And, you know, nothing comes with that. I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. I think had I known, I would say I overcame fear, but I just didn't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, really. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. And, you know, it's yes. just that I, I think it's the willingness to say yes sometimes yes. and push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone and go, why not? But I love what you said. It's like, what's the worst that can happen? And I think so many times people limit themselves in their career or, you know, just in life by go, by being too afraid to just try something. Um it, because we all have imposter syndrome, even now. And right. we look at stuff and go, oh man, what have I gotten myself into? But it's really funny. I find this for myself. You get into stuff and then all of a sudden it, it just comes to you. It's you just have this knowledge base that you have collected over the years of all the work that you've done and all the people you've met, all the articles and books that you've read. And when push comes to shove, it's there for you. And you're able to do it, or you know somebody like you said, I, I found Jim, and I, you know, I, I worked through it, and I, I managed to do that. Um, so obviously, this has worked out, you know, fantastic for you, and fantastic for the profession too, because I know you, and I referred some young associates to you because you will look after people, especially the, the naive people in this world. So I'm grateful that I have you to send some veterinarians to. What do you consider to be your biggest career mistake? You know, it's really hard for me. I mean, it's not that I don't make them. I do make them. Mm -hmm. We all make them. But looking back, I would probably say I, you know, when I started my career, I was working in in the city, in New York City. And I I started doing um, condo conversions in New York. And I had an opportunity to leave my firm and go work for the managed, you know, the developer. And part of what I, my compensation would have been was um, a two bedroom apartment on, you know, in Soho, which was at the time being sold for, I don't know, $175,000. Like it was nothing. And I would have gotten it at an insider price. And I said, you know, I don't want to be beholden to just one client. I don't want to, I want to learn a lot of different things. And so I didn't take the apartment and I didn't take the job. And right now I couldn't afford to buy that apartment because it's probably <laughs> worth about two and a half or three million dollars. So I would say that was probably right up there. I don't know that it was a mistake. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, it just didn't, it wouldn't have been the right decision. Right. Right. But looking back on it, wish, I was like, just bought the apartment, right? <laughs> Not exactly. Taking the job, just bought the apartment. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, there's there's stuff like that. You know, one of my biggest, uh, I always laugh and tell people this, you know, when IDEX went public and Zoetta spun off, I said, I kick myself every day for not buying those stocks. And now I look at them and went, man, I would have been retired. I would have uh, been in great shape if I could have bought them for like a dollar. Right. There, I think IDEX stocks sold, uh, it closed at $550 a share yesterday. Mm-hmm. So it's like, Whoa. Yeah, if we all had a crystal ball, right? Oh, like who yeah. knew it, it was on the Bowery, it was down yeah. on Prince Street. And 
at the time in New York City, it was like a danger zone. Nobody, yeah. you know, went down to the Bowery and who wanted to live on Prince Street. Well, now, you know, every boutique and every high end yeah. designer, you know, but yeah. who knew? It got, it got gentrified, right? It got gentrified. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we talked just a little bit about networking and helping you achieve your goal. Um, and we talked a little bit about uh, about vet partners, but you know, thinking about networking, a lot of people are kind of reluctant to do it, or it has like this bad connotation, like the used car salesman kind of glad handing a bunch of people and being very aggressive and pushy. But just kind of give me your opinion about, you know, what's your definition of networking? You know, I used to hate any suggestion. I, we all have an obligation as a partner in a law firm or even as an associate you know, we sponsor things, we go to events, we travel, we do whatever. I, for the longest time, I hated every minute of it. When I finally said, you know, you're going to have to do this. You need to find a way to make it work for you. And I found a way to do that. That's when I started to actually enjoy it. You can't, for me, it's, it's not a car salesman thing. If you're sincere about what you do and you sincerely want to learn about other people, to me, that's the best kind of networking that you can do. It's listening more than talking about yourself. And then part of really what I do now that inures to my benefit, just only, not by accident because things will happen, is I put people together. Like I might know a veterinarian that desperately wants to sell his practice and doesn't know how to get, you know, his books together. He doesn't know what an ad back is and he doesn't know the value of what he has. And they call because they, they Google or they do the research. And, you know, the best thing I can do is not try to sell them me. I say, listen, you don't know what you have and I don't know what you have and I don't know how to figure out what you have, but let me introduce you to Leslie. Let me introduce you to Nikolai. Let me in, you know, to people that can help you. And then if you decide that you, this is something you want to pursue and, and you want to do, want to sell or buy or do whatever, I'm, I'm always going to be here. But you have to realize that you have to make these connections and you have to build out a wheel. And, the, and then those people will think of you when they have something like that. And so for me, I think, you know, the value of networking is, is friendships. You build them. It's at, it starts out as business, but it doesn't end up as business if you do it right. Um, and you sincerely like the people and the industry that you're in. And you have to always remember that it's around world and you don't know who people know. So be discreet. Keep your, if you have a negative thing to say, don't say it because you might be wrong. Um, and, and make your own judgments. Don't take other people's words for it. But I think if you just put yourself out there and you're open and you listen, then the value of networking mm-hmm. is unmatched. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. you have to put yourself in the room with a good attitude. With a good attitude. And yeah. The curiosity. I mean, for me, I've always been curious about people and fascinated with what they do for a living and how they, you know, how they even got into it. Because sometimes sometimes we just fall into stuff, you know, and then it happens to be just the right thing for us. And so I I love to hear people's stories and what they do. And I love matchmaking. I love putting the people together and like, this is, this is who you need to talk to. Um, And, you know, at some point, maybe I can help you, but it's not today. And that's the kind of where you are. It's not today. And 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 maybe I don't help you at all. Right. 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 But, But maybe I just introduce you to someone who can. The right, and, and then you've helped right them, right? Person. Because right. even then you've helped them to find the right mm-hmm. person. But, you know, I get a, a lot of calls um, from veterinarians who are interested in their, you know, they're looking at retirement exit strategy stuff. And they think that because the corporates are buying so many hospitals that they'll just buy their practice. But what they don't realize is that's not true at all. They're very definite parameters that these companies look for Mm -hmm. in practices and if they're not prepared then they're not going to get the best price for their practice you know and so I've I've even had practitioners that just lock the door and walk away because that's why you to buy that and it's it's very sad actually I mean very sad better off giving it to an a a young associate or you know than just locking the doors and leaving but some of them are really in that position because they think that 
you know, these corporates are going to come over and they're going to handle everything they don't like about practice. Um, but that's not, you know, corporates are not looking to buy problems. <laughs> they're looking to buy people who are already in good shape. And they that's want people who are, or they want practices that have potential. Yeah. Right. Where, um, look, everybody's struggling with one with on, on the top of everyone's list, whether you are corporate or whether you are running your own practice with your partners or whatever, it's talent and it is employment and everyone is struggling. And that's why you go on LinkedIn, you can go on Harbor, you can go and see what they are doing, what corporate and others are doing to actually get out into vet schools now and mentor people and they're designing programs and it's early acts, you know, come see my culture, come see if you like us. And they're making a concerted effort, you know, grassroots effort at vet school levels. That's how deep and abiding this competition is. And it's not going to stop. It's so getting worse. It's getting and worse. it's going to get worse. I think that, you know, I look, there are people who think corporate is, I, it's still out there that it's the big evil empire. It's not, I think, like anything else. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Um, it. I live in it. I live in that world. I see good. There's there's things that are difficult about it, but I do see them also doing good things. Mm -hmm. um, they have the money and the resources to truly mentor younger veterinarians, and they are early adopters of things like mentor vet, uh, you know, and things like that, where they're putting those programs in place for the good of the profession, for the good of the people, but also because they don't want to lose those people. Mm -hmm. They want them to succeed because without their success, they won't succeed. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, don't, don't look at it so negatively. There are ways to benefit from it. And I think that we're going to see things um, change more. I think we're going to see, we're starting to see some people recognize in the corporate world. And there was a big article out in the last couple of days about um, no non-competes, that every vet should be able to, um, every associate should be able to earn a living, right? And not be tied to a non-compete. Now, when you sell your practice, that's something different, right? You have other obligations and maybe you roll over and become an owner, but just purely on an employment level, um, more and more people are seeing the value in that. And I think you're going to see that become market. I think you're going to see, I'm starting to see it. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, the corporate has the ability to influence the culture of the profession and, and for good. For good. Um, yeah. Not always for just good. for bad. Well, even look at wages and benefits. I mean, mm -hmm. I can tell you that, you know, growing up in practice, when we started, I mean, we did not have insurance for our employees. Uh, they were they were better paid than some people are paid today. I can tell you that, but but we didn't have a lot of benefits other than pet care and some other ancillary smaller things. No, we didn't have health insurance. But if you look at you know that's really market pressure has put a, a fifteen dollar minimum wage out there in almost every place and these benefit packages and continuing education for the whole staff and really education about corporate culture and the importance of it and leadership skills and that kind of training. Um, and I think that has been a lot driven by corporate groups where um, they put the systems in place, they put the training in place, and they actually have some kind of a formal plan. Now, that's not to say all of them are like that, because some of them are kind of a hot mess. They, they bought a lot so fast that they didn't put the backside in place you know, we thought they had. And, and I look at some of them and go, man, you, I mean, really, this is a, a human resources mess that you need to fix. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was because they just, you know, grew so fast. And I think they're now getting to that point where they're like, whoa, we're going to be a little more selective. We're going to be a little more judicious. And then we're going to put the back office into place much have to uh, grow their company. Stronger. They have to grow their back, back office to match the breadth of their network. Mm -hmm. I think one other thing I just came to mind while we were talking about benefits, and I think more and more, and this comes from the veterinarians who are selling as well as corporate, mm -hmm. they um, work together when they structure these deals to give profits interests 
and some equity pieces to the veterinarians, to, to the associate veterinarians and invest them with the upside if they stay and help grow. Mm -hmm. um, and some are more generous than others. Some, you know, have more strings attached than others, but it is a recognition, especially by sellers, because every dime that they leave on that bonus pool, they're giving bonuses, exit bonuses when they're leaving, they're selling, and then they're investing, you know, they're, they're contributing to those profits interests for those. Yeah. Well, behind yeah. Plan, that's, and I'm seeing it for managers too. It's not just the yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, no, for not just DVMs, for staff, for practice yeah. managers, for mm -hmm. everyone um, who help them build their business yeah. and their profit from. Yeah. I think that speaks volumes about the profession. Yeah. Um, you know, the generosity of the retiring or selling veterinarians that I've seen, some of it has been breathtaking, the amount of of um, money they're leaving behind for those that help them grow is really it's sometimes I'm speechless which is yeah. hard to do but like I read the letters of intent and I'm like wow that's very generous mm -hmm. you know that and they recognize that they didn't do it alone mm -hmm. so yeah that's pretty pretty awesome yeah I, you know I managed my first practice for 19 years and it was in a state where no one except a veterinarian could own and of course, now there's always a workaround, right? So now you can you can create a management organization. I thought, oh man, because that practice, you know, I worked hard to grow it for 19 years, and it was a two and a half million dollar practice in 2005. And I thought, oh, I, I you know, I really would have loved to have been a, a part of that partnership, mm -hmm. but it, you know, at that point in time, you didn't see things like that, and it didn't didn't happen. And um, now nah, I'm too old to do that. <laughs> you never told that's the other thing too like I just don't recognize age anymore I just yeah. figure they're recently how much longer will you do it I'm like I don't know until I don't like it until yeah and I will say you know all these years later like I graduated law school in 1983 and I got admitted to the bar that October I this is the most if you could say it's fun <laughs> stress is fun but it's the most rewarding work I've ever done because I really do feel that um, when transactions close and then I help, I help on the back end on the integration to grow those teams. It's really rewarding when you see both the company grow and the people benefit from it. You see tangible change in people's lives by, as a result of what you do. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you think about these veterinarians and, and, I've been in this profession since 1985. So I've been in there as long as you've been, uh, you know, passing the bar and watching these people and, and their work ethic is amazing and the hours that they put into their practices and to see that they're benefiting from all that effort and that their associates, I mean, like that, that practice I talked about for 19 years, the associate that bought the practice, we were his first job out of veterinary school and he never left. And right. so he grew that practice, uh, you know, as, as much as anybody else did and those are the kind of people who are getting these great windfalls and they should get those because they did, they are a, a huge amount of the revenue of that hospital and what the clients are bonded to are those people, not that building. Correct. And that is an important recognition. So I really, really love that. Um, so Mary, what advice would you give somebody who is facing this big life or career decision? I would say make it for your, get all the advice you want from the people that you trust. Do as much research as you possibly can. And then go somewhere by yourself with a legal pad and a pencil and be as honest as you can about the pluses and minuses. And if they're even, or even a little bit one, one direction or the other, you'll, you'll know. But if it's a little bit, I would say always take, take the jump, take the leap because you'll never know. And for me, the biggest pain for me is to have regret for what I didn't try. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's different, but I, I really do think nobody can make those kinds of decisions for you. Through good counsel, they can give you advice, but at the end of the day, you have to make those decisions for yourself and your family, and, and, and you have to make them with your own gut. Nobody else is going to make those decisions for yeah. you. And I see people who do nothing because they can't make a decision. And I just literally some days want to say, whether it's yes or whether it's no, just decide. Do something. Just, just do something because standing still is not serving anyone well. 
Mm-mm. So for me, I, you know, there are people that say to me, I don't think enough, but I do think enough. I think enough of, and trust my own ability and, and the safety net around me, which is my firm and my colleagues who are absolutely amazing and there for me every day and my family to support my crazy, right? What looks crazy. And it, it's turned out okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I'd say so. <laughs> So tell us a fun fact about you. Do you have a secret talent, a favorite song? Something people would be surprised to find out. Some things people would be afraid of. Uh, I love country music. I um, adore Garth Brooks beyond all measure. It's probably uh, not a healthy thing. But we, we I literally have flown to Garth Brooks concerts. Uh, probably have seen him and Billy Joel equally crazy. Uh, at least 20 times. So I love music um, and I will travel to see it. Um, yeah, I think that's probably something not a lot of people would expect a girl from Brooklyn. Not, to from, not from Brooklyn. No, I'd be uh-huh. I have to tell you, I have Garth Brooks tickets for the Charlotte show. And um, so I'm going to go up there. I can't even remember when it's like in July. So I'm going to go see Garth Brooks. And I saw Billy Joel um, when he came to NC State and I was a student. And he only had one song out. It was called Piano Man. And I watched his entire show with my elbows on the stage. Wow. Oh, and I won a competition one night. I was in the Oak Bar at the Plaza. And the piano bar. player said, who knows what this song is? And I said, it's Root Beer Rag by Julie, Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody else knew it, but I knew it. So I am, uh, I am to a Garth Brooks and Billy Joel fan, and I can't wait to see um, Garth Brooks in concert because I understand he just puts on a great show. And that's it's be amazing. Different. Yeah, it's amazing. I was uh, the last time I saw him, we were in Baltimore. We drove to Baltimore, and he did two shows. He did an early show and a late show, and we had late show tickets. And when we got there, the place was like in chaos, right? Because the electronic system had gone down. So if you did not have a paper ticket, like if you hadn't printed out your ticket and it was on your phone, they couldn't scan you into the building. My sister, who's as crazy as me, had printed the tickets because God forbid our phone died and we couldn't get in. So we were able to get in for the like nine o'clock show, whatever it was. It took them three hours (gasps) to get everyone in the building. He did not start playing until almost midnight. And he came on stage and he said, I've gotten special permission from the city of Baltimore, from the unions and everyone else. I am going to play for as long as you people will stay. And he played till almost 4 a.m. Oh, my word. Amazing. Amazing. I don't know where he got the energy because he had given one show and then sat around and waited. But yeah, the man is an entertainer. Love him or hate him. How cool is that? Well, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, okay, anything that you would like to say about yourself, your firm, a favorite book that you have, a favorite quote, or a shout out to a person other than Jim Wilson, maybe who's always <laughs> a shout out. Um, that okay. helped you. A couple things. First of all, a uh, shout out would be to Trey Cutler. Trey Cutler was president of Net Corners when I joined. He sponsored me in. Um, he has mentored me along. Um, and now we sit on opposite sides of the table uh, several times a month on opposite sides of transactions. He's always a gentleman. He's always kind. He's always professional. And he always lends a helping hand to people who need it. Uh, I greatly admire that man. I do. Uh, so that would be that. Uh, here at my firm, I, I, would, I can't single out a single person, but I will single out my, my vet practice group in the last 24 months, we have closed, I don't know, over 100 transactions. It's been insane. Um, They have worked day and night alongside of me to get it done and built an incredible team here. And so for that, I'm grateful. And I would say my favorite book, which love it or hate it, Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand. I have probably read it four or five times. Um, It's just my favorite. I, I, I don't know. It just, it, it, it kind of lights my fire when I think I can do something. Oh, cool. I love it. Well, Mary, thank you very much. And as we said, all Mary's information, contact information for her and for the firm will be in the show notes along with her bio. So if you 
uh, are uh, selling a practice, buying a practice, uh, need wonderful legal advice, I can highly recommend Miss Mary. And I uh, thank you very much for your time today, my friend. And I look forward to spending some more time with you in the very near future. I feel the same way. Thank you very much for having me. This was fun Always. and the best part of my day. I enjoyed oh, thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>